of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission and welcome each and every one of you to our annual budget forum. In past years, we've had the pleasure of greeting you in person at one of our commission auditoriums located in different regions in our beautiful county. As I look at the flyer for the budget hearing, um, I see um, yesteryear. I see some members of our commission team, some members of our Department of Parks and Recreation, one retiree, and I see two veteran champions who have fought so very, very hard for their respective communities, and that is Earl Gums and June White Dillett. So let's keep them in our thoughts because they have always been champions for their communities. But this year, in an abundance of caution due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have held or we are holding both of our budget forums virtually. We had our first one on September the 19th, and this is our second one. During these continued challenging times, we, the Commission and Planning Board, are committed to promoting a safe environment for the public, for our stakeholders, and of course for our staff, all while creating dynamic experiences, delivering innovative and exciting programs, pivoting to make sure that we don't lose a beat in providing programs to you, and maintaining our facilities, our parks, our trails that have earned our agency six national gold medals for excellence in parks and recreation management. Of course, these awards represent a collaborative effort with our elected officials, with our staff, with our volunteers, and most of all with you, our wonderful residents, our citizens, and our community partners. So let me say at the outset, we are unabashedly proud. We are Mer Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission proud. We are Prince George's proud. We are proud to be stewards of our historical and natural resources, proud to provide a vast array of exciting, innovative, and recreational programs for healthy lifestyles, proud to provide sound land use planning and development in line with the laws enacted by our legislative bodies, and interpreted by our courts. Proud to serve the 900,000 plus residents and visitors to our county. And proud to be counted in the 2020 census. So, there's been some confusion about the census because the deadline seems to have been a moving target and possibly again. But we hope, we certainly hope that each of you is proud to be counted in the 2020 census also. The census deadline as of today has, has extended until October 31st, 2020, which means we only have 18 days left to get our numbers up. Those numbers mean federal funds to our community, funds for schools, funds for school lunches, funds for roads, funds for transportation, funds for transit, funds for veterans. Um, services, funds for so many different things, funds for SNAP, funds for WIC. And this, we could use this, you are here today to testify about what you would like to see included in our budget. Wouldn't those hundreds of millions of dollars that we would get in federal fundings, if, you, if each person is counted, wouldn't that help? So my charge to you is to make sure you complete your census, make sure you tell everyone you know. It only takes 10 minutes, it's easy, safe, and critical. Tell your neighbors, call, text, encourage everyone. Make sure you tell your HOA, your homeowners association, your civic association, your churches, your municipalities. Make sure they announce, make sure they post, make sure they utilize social media because we need that money in Prince George's County. In 2010, we left $363 million on the table. I bet you we could have um, funded most of the things that you're requesting today. So let's not leave all that money on the table. We're counting on you to get our numbers up, and we can do this. My2020census.gov or 844-330-2020. So through your testimony tonight, we will continue to build on our award-winning programs, support our community's growth towards economic development, and most important, we will plan for future generations. So to begin tonight's forum, I'm pleased to introduce my colleagues from the Prince George's County Planning Board who are joining us today. I know we have Vice Chair Dorothy Bailey, uh, and there she is. We have um, 
Commissioner Will Dorner. There he is. We have Commissioner uh, Man Man Manny Geraldo, and we have Commissioner Good evening, everybody. and we have Commissioner Shawnee Washington all uh, present. Um, this meeting is being video recorded and will be archived on the Planning Board's website at uh, pgplanningboard.org. This evening, we're soliciting your ideas on what you would like to see in our fiscal 22 operating budget for the Commission's Department of Parks and Recreation and for the Commission's Planning Department. Prior to hearing from you tonight, we will give you a brief overview of the budget process, the operating budget, how expenditures are allocated, the overall budget process timeline, and we will touch briefly on the capital improvement program. Now, it is imperative to note that capital improvement projects are initially approved by the Prince George's County Council for only uh, the first year of a long-term planning cycle. First year of a long-term planning cycle. And that the actual funding for projects may or may not be approved by the council in future years. Future years. Sometimes projects go forward as planned, sometimes projects are removed, and sometimes projects are moved to outer years. Also, in addition to your request that you bring to us tonight, we're sure you are aware of the many needs of Prince George's County residents, especially in this current environment. Schools, emergency services, and more. So as always, we will continue to work diligently and closely with our county partners to balance community needs with fiscal realities. And in so doing, we will address significant infrastructure improvement needs as well. Now we remind you that you need not wait for these annual budget forms to express your concerns or requests of a more minor nature, such as maintenance or disrepair at our facilities. So how to get help. These concerns may and should be handled by our staff throughout the year. Simply call the Department of Parks and Recreation Help Desk at the number depicted on the screen. Send an email to customer service at pgparks.com as shown on the screen. You can call the Planning Department at 301-952-3530, my office at 301-952-3560, or you may contact us through the website at pgplanningboard.org to express your concerns. We sincerely appreciate that you've taken the time to join us this evening and share your thoughts and ideas with us. But most important, we thank you for your ongoing advice, support, and partnership. I also like to take a moment to introduce um, several key members from our planning department and parks and recreation departments. Uh, they will be listening to, and, and others will be listening as well, but I'm only going to introduce some. First, we have our the commission's executive director, Asantha Chang Smith. And there she is waving. We have our corporate budget director, who you'll hear from shortly, John Kroll. There we go. We have our planning director, Andre Green Checkley. There you go. And we have our acting deputy director of planning, Derek Verlage. We, we have our director of parks and recreation, Bill Tyler. We have our deputy director for, uh, for facility operations, Steve Carter. We have um, our Acting Deputy Director for Administration and Development, Alvin McNeil. There we go. We have our Acting Deputy Director for Area Operations, Wanda Ramos. We have our Chief of Park Police, Chief Stanley Johnson. There he is waving. Um, Chief Johnson, you missed our, my big announcement last week when I gave you great kudos for receiving the Purple Light Award from Sheriff High for your effort and the efforts of our amazing park police for shattering the silence and doing everything within your power to stamp out domestic violence. So, thank you. Congratulations thank you so to you. Um, okay, so now for the participation guidelines. Regist registered speakers connected through a computer, tablet, or smartphone are joining the meeting with the link via the v email provided by the Planning Board Office. Online registered participants may be prompted to install GoToMeeting software in order to participate. Registered speakers may also listen or participate using a phone line via the call-in number provided via the email. 
All of this stuff is depicted on the screens, but I repeated some for those who are just listening. So this evening, we will follow this format. We'll hear a brief overview of the Commission's budget process in Prince George's County from our Corporate Budget Director, John Kroll. And then we will hear from you. We ask that you limit your remarks to three minutes, 30 seconds before your time is up, a yellow light will appear on your time clock. And this is the signal for you to bring your comments to a close. A red light and chime will signal that your time is up. And please conclude your remarks at that time. But if you weren't finished or something else comes to mind after that, we will be accepting written comments until the close of business on Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. They can be submitted via mail. Is everything depicted on the screen via mail, fax, or email? So we will now turn to our corporate budget director, John Kroll, to deliver a PowerPoint presentation. Mr. Kroll, you are on. Okay, wait a minute, you're muted. We're trying to unmute. Hold on, John. Hold on, Mr. Kroll. Hold on. Okay. I'm unmuted now, yes. and I'm waiting for people to put the slides up on screen. Okay, there we go. As the chair noted, there are two uh, budget uh, a couple weeks ago on September 29th, and this is the second of two. Next slide, please. With the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, we're a five-county agency serving Prince George's and Montgomery County. We were created in 1927 by the Maryland General Assembly. The planning board oversees the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Planning Department. Next slide. We serve all the residents of Prince George's County, as well as our visitors. Since 2006, the population we serve has grown by about 74,000 people. We're up a little above 900,000 now in Prince George's County. Next slide. Our mission is to manage physical growth and plan communities, to protect and steward natural, cultural, and historic resources, and to provide leisure and recreational experiences. We maintain natural areas and parks throughout the county. These locations offer residents opportunities to recreate and enjoy the open space and natural resources. It is shown here in the graphic on this slide. Uh, as the chair also mentioned, we are a six-time National Gold Medal Award winner for excellence in park and recreation management. Next slide. Services are paid for primarily through property taxes. Property taxes make up about 84% of the revenue to pay for those services. The current property tax rates are 29.4 cents per $100 of assessed value for real property and 73.5 cents for um, personal property. Budget uh, revenue of total for fiscal year 21, the year that we're in now, about $367 million. Next slide. This costs the average homeowner about $968 a year in property taxes for all the services delivered by the commission. That's a generous $2.65 a day. That's based on the uh, average value of a Prince George's County home uh, from uh, July assessable base files. Next slide. And this is what your investment brings. A vast array of services and facilities throughout the county. Everything from cricket fields, to playgrounds, to miles and miles of trails, campgrounds, community centers, an airport, um, tennis courts, athletic fields, historic sites. Next slide. Expenditures are for the current fiscal year budgeted about $365 million for all the operating funds of on this side of the commission. Most of that budget, about 77%, is spent on parks and recreation services with the planning department coming in second. Next slide. This slide shows the, six, the um, approved six-year capital improvements program, fiscal year 21 through fiscal year 26. Shows the revenue sources at the top, and the categories of expenditure on the bottom. They range from acquisition, aquatic, uh, needs historical facilities, renovation of both facilities and park and playground and fields, stormwater maintenance, trails and new construction. 
Um, as the chair noted in her opening remarks, only the first year, fiscal year 21, is currently funded. Subsequent years are subject to change each year's budget process. Next slide. Budget cycle is almost a full year cycle. Begins in July and August with the initial planning and analysis. Moves on to the public budget forum stage, of which this is the second of two. We get spending affordability committee uh, from the county guidance early on at the end of August and then again in December. We get planning board guidance in, uh, in September, October. We get planning uh, board approval of the uh, budget as presented or as proposed in November. The commission adopts the proposed budget in December. Budget office then publishes the budget books and submits those to the county council and executive in mid-January, followed by budget hearings and meetings with the county. County executive then sends his budget recommend his or her budget recommendations uh, to the county council. We have uh, a joint county council meeting for commission-wide items in May, and then final budget adoption takes place in May and June. Next slide, please. Property taxes or property values slumped in the past. They've continued to recover since that point in time. We've previously, uh, uh, in 2021, we surpassed the previous highs of 2010. In 2022, property values are projected to increase by an additional 3%. Next slide. Uh, tax revenue picture, uh, which flows uh, from those property values from the peak in 2010 to 2014, Fixed $56 million in revenues annually had been lost to the housing market collapse. Since that point in time, though, we've had a recovery in the housing market, coupled with a modest tax rate increase in 2016 that's helped restore our fiscal health. The estimated uh, property tax revenue picture for, two, for this current year is $307 million. Next slide. The outlook for this coming year Again, property tax revenue is projected to increase by 8.3 million. You'll see that on the left uh, bar, uh, the, the bar graph there. Major costs, uh, there, there we go, back. Uh, major costs are projected to decrease by 2.2 million, primarily uh, CIP PAYGO. Um, and keep in mind that those expenses are just the known ones uh, that are fixed costs. Um, these do not include at this at this point in this graph um, any um, projected uh, increases either due to uh, the pandemic and related expenses or for new initiatives that we might be uh, proposing uh, to further serve our citizenry. Next slide, please. The strategy for developing the budget for this coming year Assuming our property value projections are realized, we're projected to be in good fiscal shape through fiscal year 27. The challenges for this coming year are to continue to address infrastructure improvement needs in our facilities, utilizing PAYGO, which is cash, in both the park and recreation funds, to continue to develop innovative programming offerings that meet the needs of all county residents, and to continue to implement a six-year planning work program, primarily focusing on plans, studies and priority implementation activities that are consistent with plan 2035 recommendations. New this year, we'll be proposing adjustments to reflect expected operational and service provision changes due to the pandemic effect, all while balancing community needs with fiscal reality. The commission is committed to building strong, healthy, sustainable communities with your help and input will continue to do so. And thank you in advance for participating in tonight's forum. Thank you so much, Mr. Kroll. So we will now begin the very best part of tonight's forum, and that is eliciting formal testimony from you where, you, where, where we get to hear from you. So first we invite our elected officials who have joined this evening to give their comments, followed by additional participants who will be called in the order in which they registered to speak. 
Again, we ask that you limit your remarks to three minutes and 30 seconds before your time is up. A yellow light will appear on the time clock, and this is your uh, um, signal to complete your, to wrap up your comments to close. A red light and chime will signal that your time is up, so please complete your remarks at that time. Again, not everyone will be on at the end because most people will stay on for their portion and then leave. So we, I do want to take this opportunity to really thank each of you for sharing your evening with us, communicating what your needs and desires are, um, working with us as we try to navigate these very, very challenging times. Um, they're, they're just really, really bad, but I know that we will get through this together. And without further ado, we're going to go in the order of the folks signed up. So we have um, the mayor of City of College Park, Patrick Wohan. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Hewer. Thank you, members of the planning board. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you this evening. I, uh, I, I want to, um, you should have received a copy of the letter that we sent that was passed unanimously by the College Park City Council back in, in April yeah. that highlighted in the, the things that we would like to uh, uh, prioritize in terms of the park and planning uh, budget this uh, next fiscal year. Uh, we understand that there, are, that there are real challenges that you all are facing and uh, and we, we uh, appreciate that we in College Park are facing similar challenges right now. We've had to do budget cuts, uh, but we understand that also that there are things that we need to prioritize and, and should prioritize uh, to address to continue to address the needs of our, our community. Uh, one uh, I want to talk about is the, is the transportation action guide for urban communities. I understand that in this fiscal year's budget, the, the um, that guide uh, is uh, there's a recommendation to continue proceeding with with the recommendations in that guide. The one thing I want to focus on in particular is is connectivity of our trail networks. Um, one thing that has come to life during this pandemic is that uh, is that well people are uh, oftentimes stuck in their homes. People do still need to get out. We have essential workers that need to get around, and we have people uh, need to get out and uh, and get uh, get exercise. And uh, the, the demand for connected active transportation infrastructure, say for just a walk and bike, has exploded. Uh, if you've seen some of our bike shops in the area, you can see that they that they have trouble keeping bikes in stock because they're so popular. Uh, and and our community is demanding that that space. In some in some cases, just so they can get outside. But we also have because uh, uh, many of our low in lower income residents uh, they, uh, may not have cars. Uh, also, uh, we, our transit system is facing real challenges, and uh, people are oftentimes reluctant to, to use transit. So they turn to biking and walking to get around. Um, the Transportation Action Guide includes several different recommendations for connecting our communities by walking and biking, uh, especially in College Park and, uh, and in the northern part of the county. Um, but uh, it also ties into the Capital Trails Coalition Network, uh, which will be part of a massive regional uh, system of, of trails. Uh, that will help people get to the places where they need to go on a daily basis. Uh, one specific project within College Park that we're looking to proceed with is to connect the Paint Branch Playground on the eastern side of the Paint Branch uh, near uh, near near Cabinet, not near what's now called Campus Drive, but many of us remember as Paint Branch Parkway. To connect that park to the western side of the of the Paint Branch uh, and a river, and to connect a significant uh, uh, large neighborhood, a residential neighborhood in College Park. Uh, to the trail system and to the College Park Metro system by trail. One, one other thing that I want to um, focus on and highlight is in, the, uh, in the budget for this year that I would like to see continue for next year uh, is a feasibility study for an indoor uh, facility in North, Northern College Park. Uh, residents of North College Park have long sought this uh, facility as a way to, to access um, uh, close by uh, uh, through walking and biking uh, um, uh, recreational facilities. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing that uh, feasibility study uh, completed. Uh, so far, it hasn't been start, started yet, but we'd like to see then uh, some, some funds put into the budget to follow up on uh, whatever that the feasibility study finds. Uh, the City of College Park is eager to work with the Park and Planning Commission uh, and with the Parks and Recreation staff to see that, uh, see that facility come to fruition. Uh, so thank you once again for the opportunity to, to testify this evening. Uh, please, uh, my, my contact information is on the College Park website, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Okay, thank you, um, Mayor Wohan. Um, before I go on to the next speaker, um, we, I see we have several mayors signed up, but I wanted to um, dovetail on my announcement that I made. I talked about how important census is to each and every one of us, but I will tell you that the um, Supreme Court today 
um, just granted a request from President Trump's administration to halt the census count while an appeal um, plays out. So um, I'm really hoping uh, our numbers are not where they should be. Uh, we have a number of people who did not um, complete the census, and, and we're pretty much leaving over $300 million on the table. And if this stays in effect, given the Supreme Court's ruling, that's what Prince George's County has lost out on. So I don't know when, if that takes effect right here, right now, but I'm telling you, if you can get your last minute people getting their census in, it's imperative that they do that. Thank you. And, and, and so I have four mayors on, and that way you can get that information to people. Thank you. Um, uh, Jeff Shomich from the mayor, um, or Mayor Jeff Shomich from the town of Landover Hills. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, Landover Hills and the surrounding unincorporated areas have been working toward and requesting a community center for more than 20 years through a coalition of town and homeowner association officials and residents. In January 2019, staff members from the planning division hosted a meeting with the coalition at the Landover Hills Town Hall outlining a plan to build nine multi-generational community centers in Prince George's County. The town and coalition enthusiastically support this plan and urge moving forward with construction of a multi-generational community center in this area. Uh, the Landover Hills Town Council attended last year's budget forum and again requested a multi-generational community center for our area. Uh, this September, a community leaders focus group was conducted to discuss community needs. The information from the focus groups will be fed into the larger community-wide meeting planned for the end of this month or early November, we were told, uh, to discuss programs and features for the center. Uh, it became clear in the focus groups that the recreational and communal needs of our youth and elderly are severely underserved in our area. We request the planning board plays a high priority on completing the planning for a multi-generational community center in our area and ultimately approve construction of the project, which has been advocated by the town of Landover Hills and the surrounding communities for more than 20 years. Thank you again for your consideration. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so we also have Mayor Amanda Dewey from the town of Berwyn Heights. Hold on while we scroll down for you. Not on there? Okay, so I, we do not see Mayor Amanda Dewey, and I do not see and hear anyone speaking up for her unless she's caller three or four. Can this unmute them? Mayor Amanda Dewey. Okay, so we'll go to Mayor Alan Thompson from the town of Riverdale Park. So let's try those two phone numbers. Including ways for construction and the noise and Okay, Ms. Checkley? Okay. Okay, three or four. No, no, Mayor Thompson. Okay, how about Sarah Cabot? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. This is, uh, my name is Sarah Cabot. And I'm here representing the Indian Head Highway Area Action Council. And first of all, we want to say congratulations and send our compliments to everyone at MNCPPC that has kept things moving during this really difficult time for everybody. Uh, we really appreciate the technology you have employed and utilized to help keep us informed and aware especially the SDRC meetings being posted. We hope that continues even after the virtual meetings are required. On parks and recreation items, 
because of the severe times and budget constraints that we're going to be going through, we believe maintenance of the facilities we already have have to be the first priority. We, of course, though, would like to see the Tucker Road ice rink finished at some point. Uh, we also agree with the mayor that programs that are structured for the vulnerable, the youth, and the seniors should be emphasized during this really difficult time. On planning issues and information access, we really want the zoning map amendment, the county map amendment to project to go forward. And we really ask for all public facilities to be equipped in their public spaces with hearing assisted devices and that we take into account that a larger percentage of the population is um, able to communicate via closed captioning as opposed to sign language. And I have submitted the um, remarks in writing and I thank you very much and everybody please stay healthy. Um, thank you so much Ms. Cavett. I'm not sure I heard you. What was that one part about the countywide map amendment? Uh, we'd really like to make sure it goes forward. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Cavett. Appreciate you. Um, Aaron Markovich, Anacostia Trails Heritage Area Incorporated. Hi there. Hello okay. there. We heard you. Um, oh, there you are. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Markovich. I'm representing Maryland Milestones Anacostia Trails Heritage Area. Um, those of you who know me know me uh, as the executive director, but tonight, which may be my last uh, MNCPPC public budget hearing, I'm here simply representing them. I've moved on to a new position and the board will be looking for a new director. Uh, the new director will most certainly look to continue the great relationship we've had with MNCPPC. Um, particularly the Natural and Historical Resources Division for Sites and Trails. I know our Board of Directors is anxious about this next step and are looking to bring on somebody who can support the great uh, stories in this county, uh, as well as work with all the various parts of park and planning. So I'm here largely for three reasons. First, to say thank you uh, to our chair, to the board, uh, and to the staff uh, that have shown me and our organization such uh, great things. Uh, second, I'm, say, I'm here to say thank you for supporting the ongoing preservation of historic sites in the county through the Comprehensive Capital Improvement Budget. Uh, you have an amazing historic sites team working on those issues. And finally, I want to say thank you for the ongoing fiscal support you've shown our organization through our partnership work. We hope that we can continue to extend the reach of park and planning and expand the ways in which our shared goals move forward. Uh, I believe that I've mentioned it before, but our organization is looking at how we can expand our reach countywide, providing access to state level grants programs. Um, and we hope that as that project comes on in the next year or two, that we will have your support as well. Our consultants have been reaching out to the staff um, on these issues and more will come in the, in the future years. Um, additionally, I wanted to point out that the congressional representatives, particularly um, uh, District 5 are working on a designation for a national heritage area that may encompass the southern parts of Prince George's County. Uh, more uh, will be coming on that as well. So to wrap up, uh, I want to again thank uh, you, uh, Betty, but everybody else uh, for all you've done and all you do. Um, and I hope that my departure doesn't change the relationship that Park and Planning and Anacostia Trails Heritage Area has. Um, it's a great relationship with plenty of room to grow. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Markovich. And I, before we go on to the next speaker, it is impossible for we for us to just move on without saying thank you so very, very much for all that you've done. You've done spectacular work. Um, we've so enjoyed working with you. It's been a great partnership. We had one before before your time, but um, but you, but you elevated it, which is you know better still. And I'm hoping, just as you are, that we will continue. And I have no doubt that we will continue with a uh, a wonderful relationship. And we'll find out offline where you're going after this. <laughs> but, but I appreciate it. Thank but you. But we do want to say thank you so very much. Okay, so I, I think we have Mayor Alan Thompson back from Riverdale Park. Mr. Thompson, Mayor Thompson. 
Uh oh. Thank you, Madam okay, Chair. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I want to mention that I did not receive the email. I have had to pick the meeting ID off of your screen. Okay. Uh, but anyway, okay. <laughs> I made it. Okay. So the um, thank you. The, the main reason I want to speak with you, the town actually submitted written comments uh, last week, and so you should have them those in the record. But I wanted to point out an unusual item that is on our request for this year, and that is that in the wake of the flood that we had on September 10th in town, yes. and we are looking at some possible dual use of park facilities as surge stormwater places. We're very early in this discussion. We're working with county stormwater. And um, in the letter, we, we of course asked for some budgetary support, but uh, I don't see anything likely happening this fiscal year, but I just wanted to get this onto your radar or something that will be uh, coming up in future years. Okay. Is that it? And uh, that's, that's it. The, okay. other, the other items are in the written the report. Uh, there's, you know, volleyball court, gas, basketball court, uh, support for Riversdale, et cetera. And so that will, uh, that will finish my uh, testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Thompson. Um, okay, so we're going to keep on going down. Now, we have some, okay. Oh, Mayor Amanda Dewey, you're on from Berwyn Heights. And, and our, our folks will be reaching out to you to find out what happened. Um, that's what I was t I'll tell you to, after this. Okay, Mayor, Mayor thank Dewey. You. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'll keep my comments brief and I appreciate the opportunity to comment here. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to, you know, express our gratitude um, for all, you know, the work of the commission, for the, of the board rather, um, but really to just sort of express our desire for a focus on maintenance um, in our community and surrounding communities. You know, I understand at the level of the budget, uh, it's not clear, and, and this is understandable, exactly what projects are given priority or sort of the order of operations around project maintenance. But in Berwyn Heights, we've got a tennis court and a basketball court, for example, at the Berwyn Heights Community Center that are in really significant states of disrepair. Um, and so we would love to see projects like that and, and areas like that really maintained, just because when they're not maintained, they don't serve as an asset to the community as they otherwise could. Um, the tennis courts, some families go and try to use them, but upon you know, realizing the condition that they're in, can't really play effectively. And then similarly, uh, Sports Park in Berwyn Heights is also slated for some renovation. The field is so compacted um, that it's hard to play on. And I know that we've talked with Park and Planning many times about the plans to renovate that. Um, and so we just want to express so uh, sort of our desire for a continued focus on those sorts of projects, maintaining our facilities so that they can actually be used and sort of take care of our investments for the future. Um. Thank you, Mayor Dewey. I just want—I don't know if you were on. I, I, you might not have been on in, during my opening remarks, but we always talk about you. Don't wait for the budget hearings to talk about maintenance. I mean, you don't have to because um, our folks are—you know—maintenance and when something is in disrepair, you know, you can call us anytime, anytime throughout the year for that part. Um, and I really appreciate that. I'll, I'll be honest and say we have had difficulty in the past, sort of getting to the right person. And I've had sort of issues where things are kind of passed down the line or we can't get a hold of anybody um, and things sort of, you know, and I really appreciate that offer and we certainly will take you up on it. But and, and um, guess I guess I'm making this comment both on a micro level, but also on a sort of a broader budget level um, as an area of focus. Okay, but guess, guess what? So we have, um, we're not going to give out phone numbers and whatnot, email addresses. Um, publicly like this, but we have them because you signed up. And so our Department of Parks and Recreation will reach out to you we'll, privately to talk about your Thank concerns. Thank you very much. Um, and, and then you'll have a point person. Um, so that, Much appreciated. Oh, yeah, no worries. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. You, have a great evening. You too. Okay. Um, so Marion um, Dabrowski. Hello, uh, Ms. Hewitt, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, a proud Prince George and for almost 40 years. Tonight I am here to request that the Commission collaborate with the District of Columbia in preparation and execution of the Anacostia River Corridor Red Restoration Plan. I'm the Vice Chair of the Community Advisory Committee to the Anacostia Watershed Restoration Partnership a body to which the commission also belongs. Like the commission, our members steward the Anacostia and its many tributaries. After 
decades of collaboration, uh, the Anacostia River will be swimmable within five years. This is a remarkable milestone. We must protect this unique resource and work to ensure its resilience. Worsening flooding is the consequence of poor land use practices. The results are readily apparent in the condition of our stream valleys and waterfront parks. Restoration of these resources holds solutions to these growing problems. The Bladensburg Waterfront Park is the gateway to one of the most remarkable natural areas in the country. The first mile of the Anacostia was designated a Maryland Scenic and Wild River in 1984. From our border two miles south to Benning Road, the one designated the Anacostia is also scenic and wild. Along its shores lie some of the most unique parks in the region, and all of this in a major urban area. The land was acquired under the Capra Crampton Act to protect and preserve the Anacostia for the health and enjoyment of present and future generations. We ask the commission to make the goals of this act its number one priority and to partner with agencies, stewards, and stakeholders to achieve a common vision for the entire river and park system. The history of Bladensburg Marina illustrates the consequences of the inaction. Bladensburg was once the largest and fastest growing port on the eastern seaboard, one mile wide and 40 feet deep. Today, the Anacostia is confined within a narrow levee. In several locations, you can walk across the river at low tide. Every year, the marina is stretched to a depth of eight feet to allow passage of low draft watercraft. Every year, it silts in eight feet. Flash flooding destroys our community's waterways and natural areas. The EPA strategy for sustainable communities include preservation and restoration of open space and critical environmental areas. FEMA states that floods are the most widespread of all natural disasters except fire and identifies wetlands as the most effective flood control measure. Restoration and resiliency must be central to all activities of the commission. Please fund and foster regional collaboration through the Urban Waters Federal Partnership and participate fully in the Anacostia River Corridor Restoration Plan. The Steward community supports you. Okay. Um, we thank you for we thank you for your comments and for reminding everyone of the beauty and the of the historic nature of the Anacostia River. Um, I, you know, it's, it's just majestic, and it really has come a long way in several years. Where you at one point you couldn't eat the fish from there, and now you know you're going to be able to swim in there s soon. Um, I think of Dueling Creek. Um, it's just it's so much history. So thank you for pointing that out. And if you have more comments, feel free to write. Um, until um, close of business on October 27th as well. Okay. We will. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Thank you. Um, Kim Rush Lynch with the Prince George's Soil Conservation District. Good evening, Chair Hewlett and members Good of evening. the Planning Board. Good evening. My name is Kim Rush Lynch. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm the Urban Agricultural Conservation Planner with the Prince George's Soil Conservation District and a Greenbelt resident. And I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share with you how the proposed Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission's Urban Farm Incubator will support the urban agriculture industry in Prince George's County. Currently, the district has provided resources or technical assistance to 40 aspiring or current urban farmers in Prince George's County, 15 of which are cooperators in our urban ag conservation program. One of the largest barriers for our aspiring farmers is land access. We are excited to partner with the Commission on this initiative that will address this common challenge. Currently, the district has soil conservation and water quality plans with county farmers with medium to large acreage leases on Commission-owned agricultural lands. These plans promote soil health and improve water quality, as well as conserve the county's soil and water resources. We feel that it's a natural next step for the Commission to work with and support small farm operations in Prince George's County especially in light of several commission planning documents referencing urban agriculture and its importance to healthy food access, environmental stewardship, and economic development. The Urban Farm Incubator has the potential to expand the commission's goal of preserving open space, farming culture, and agricultural lands in our more urban and peri-urban areas. It also supports the commission's diversity, equity, 
and inclusion initiatives and commitment to the health of our residents. One notable example of how the commission is supporting urban farmers is through its leases with EcoCity Farms in Edmonston and more recently EcoBlossom Farms and Sweet Love Flower Farm at the Chapman Farm parcel on the Patuxent River. Both urban flower farms are black women owned and operated. They started their farms on small residential parcels and the commission is giving them the opportunity to expand their operations. Finally, the urban farm incubator will be a demonstration and teaching farm that could serve our high school students participating in the environment, ag and natural resources program. These students are learning about career development opportunities in agriculture and environmental science. Both the district and the commission serve on the program advisory committee. This project would be an innovative model used by our students that could be replicated on other commission owned lands such as Walker Mill Park. The district supports initiatives that improve health, education, economic development, and the environment for Prince Georgians through soil and water conservation and urban ag. The district is prepared to provide in-kind support to this project through conservation practice designs and other technical assistance that will reduce soil erosion while managing nutrients and reducing stormwater runoff. These efforts will improve the project site as well as the community garden and wetlands immediately downstream. The mission of this project aligns well with the district's mission, and we look forward to the continued cooperative partnership with the commission. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lynch. Uh, we appreciate it. If you have anything else to add, we'll um, please submit it in writing. Okay, thank you thank so you. much. Um, and hello to Steve. Okay, Jonathan Caballero. Uh, hi, everyone. Representing uh, the Northern Gateway. First of all, we'd just like to say thank you. Uh, from the Northern Gateway, that's correct. <laughs> just like to say thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the Prince George's County Plan Board for listening to the concerns and the budget priorities of the community as part of the budget process during these very difficult times. Um, at least for me, it brings a sense of normality, and I think that's what we need to <laughs> have a little bit more of. So thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Caballero, and I'm here on behalf of the Northern Gateway CDC, and I'm also a Langley Park resident. Uh, so the Northern Gateway CDC really appreciates and fully supports the funding for the Langley Park Lighting Project as a top priority for the area, especially because many of our residents use the trails not only for recreation but also as a way of getting to work and to connect to public transportation. Um, additionally, we are asking for support for the renovation of the Rolling Crest Chillen Community Center and also park improvements in the Northern Gateway area, which includes all of the unincorporated neighborhoods of District 2. Uh, it is our hope that these projects would bring functional facilities and programs for the residents of the area uh, to lead a long and healthy life uh, and create a stronger sense of community. We are also here to ask for um, the MTPPC to fund Northern Gateway virtual workshops with our residents and business owners uh, to continue placemaking, revitalization, and planning activities in partnership um, with the Northern Gateway CDC um, at $50,000 and ask for MNCPPC to expedite continuation of the PAMC placemaking and spaces project, which were stalled by COVID-19. Um, and yeah, our, our small, small businesses in the area have been uh, doubly hit, uh, not only by COVID-19, but also the purple line construction. Um, so we really hope that maybe this could be worked into the budget to um, bring virtual workshops and work with them. Um, also, the CDC hopes uh, uh, the MTPPC will continue to uh, work with uh, PGCPS to expedite school construction plans, where we have some schools at over 125% capacity. Um, I, we think especially after COVID-19, children should not be returning to extremely overcrowded classrooms. Um, and I can submit in writing this testimony and funding requests with more detail, as well as recent reports uh, and media coverage that show the devastating impact of COVID-19 on immigrant Latino communities, which comprise the majority of residents within the Northern Gateway. Um, additionally, I can submit petitions in support of the Northern Gateway investments needed for a robust recovery amid the effects of the South Corporal Line and the pandemic. Um, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Caballero, and we look forward to your written remarks as well. Um, is it Trees West? 
I might not have pronounced it correctly. From Berwyn Heights, Trees West. No? Okay. I'm David Tansy. From Chevrolet. Yes. I'm okay. here. Thank okay, you. wonderful. Wonderful. Um, hi, my name's David Tansy. I am in Chevrolet, Maryland. My family took to biking this spring. It is something we could all do during the pandemic. I've now been up and down the beautiful Anacostia River Trail dozens of times. I would love to be able to do that without having to drive there since the river is only about two miles away from my house. While speaking to neighbors, I learned that paths from Chevrolet to the Anacostia River Trail have been thought through before. I have not seen the plans, but my neighbors spoke as if they had been drawn out previously as proposals. I believe a path along the railway that goes along Beaver Creek, uh, Beaver Dam Creek would be the best option. There seems to be plenty of space on the north side of the rail railway. At some point, the trail would have to cross Route 50, so I'm not sure where it would meet Chevrolet. The other option is to build a route that connects to the back access of Bladensburg Waterfront Park on Lloyd Street. Newton Street would take you most of the way, but the majority of Chevrolet would still have to cross BW Parkway via 202. That is not a family-friendly intersection, and the roads around Kenilworth Avenue are not currently bike-friendly. Many of my neighbors have taken a biking in 2020. I think a path to the river would encourage that further. I would also, it would also help Chevrolet more broadly. We've always been bound by Route 50, BW Parkway, and Route 202. If we had a dedicated path out of Chevrolet that didn't require a car, we would become a more walkable community. That's, I'm not representing anybody, I'm just a resident, but uh, that's what I came here to say. And we appreciate your speaking for yourself. Um, that you're absolutely entitled, so we want to hear from individuals as well. Thank you. Thank um, you. Um, Margaret Morgan Hubbard. We're unmuting you, so hold tight. There we go. I, okay, thank you. Um, I'm a, um, the CEO of Eco City Farms and um, a more than 30 year resident of the county. And I'd like to thank you for listening to my testimony. After 10 long years, thanks to the parkland in Edmondston made available to us by Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and with many advantages, advances and setbacks, Eco City Farms has become the premier urban farm in the Metro DC region, employing seven people full time and exposing hundreds of people yearly to the art and science of urban food production. We've taught many hundreds of county residents, aspiring farmers and their families at our farm about cultivating and sustainably growing um, vegetables, cooking, nutrition, composting, herbalism, farm, basic business skills, and responsible environmental stewardship. Together with the Prince George's Community College, we issued a certificate of completion in commercial urban agriculture to hundreds of trainees who attended our series of courses, and we are just now completing the fourth of a six-year USDA training grant to um, produce urban farmers to fulfill ECO's mission to grow great food farms and farmers. We are founding members of the Prince George's Food Equity Council and serve on the Agricultural Resources Advisory Commission Committee to advise the county on farming issues. Yet despite our collective work to date, urban farms have not proliferated as rapidly as we initially imagined. We need more urban farms. Collectively, we need to find innovative land access opportunities to accomplish this. Um, so we continue to work closely with parks and recreation department with the county soil conservation district with the food equity council on advancing smaller urban farming in the county we applaud the proposed incubator or starting farmland at watkins regional park that would provide greatly needed land for a number of the talented farmers we and others have trained while preserving open space farming and agricultural lands in the, within the Beltway. 
Parks and Recreation Department has a very successful and robust community gardening program for community members and leases large tracts of land to establish farmers in the county. However, there is a large unmet demand for a bridge between these two offerings, that is, land for new and emerging farmers to begin to establish small viable farming businesses. The starter or incubator farm model has been well tested in other jurisdictions. After the Watkins incubator is launched, lessons learned there could proliferate farmland at Miller Regional Park and at other sites. Um, we Ms. urge Ms. full Hubbard, funding. Ms. Hubbard, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up now that your time has expired. I don't, thank you. I just was saying that we urge full funding for this important next step at Watkins Regional Park. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you have more to add, you feel free to submit the, um, additional comments in writing. Thank you so much. I will. Okay. Thank you. Kwaisi Asante, also Echo City Farm. Yes, thank you very much for uh, having me. My name is Kwaisi Asante. I am the coordinator of um, farm education and training at Echo City Farms. And I'm here on behalf of the proposed Watkin Park, uh, of which uh, Margaret just spoke about. I came to work for Echo uh, after taking part in the uh, PGCC class that uh, Eco offered, I uh, actually did that through uh, the uh, Future Harvest, and I fell in love with Eco. Uh, they welcomed me, and <clears throat> I took interest in their vermicomposting, uh, which was very uh, educational and very helpful to me. Um, since I already had an extensive knowledge in agriculture from uh, growing up in Ghana, uh, I became fascinated with urban farm when I had when I heard of it because I had already been exposed to rural or you know farmland farming. Um, the sustainability and and the Prince George's County's uh, interest and promotion of uh, sustainable sustainable agriculture was really fascinating to me. Um, my main responsibility as a coordinator of the training program uh, is to uh, facilitate the beginning farmers training program. Many of the trainees, uh, we had just about, uh, by the end of this month, we will finish uh, training of 19 residents of uh, uh, Prince George's County and the surrounding counties. Uh, after we finish the after we finish the three months of training uh, at the community college, we came to the farm to uh, do the hands-on training. And we have successfully uh, trained active residents. Ten of them had, you know, even in the, in the face of all this pandemic, have been able to uh, finish their training and they will be awarded certificates of completion. Um, I am here basically because I have personal experience with food growing and this incubator farm means a lot to me. As a result of uh, this incubator farm, I have actually started looking to uh, relocate. I live in uh, Annapolis, but I want to relocate to Prince George's County. Uh, there are many people who live in the county interested in this farming. Uh, uh, Corey is a retired military service member who is looking forward to it. He lives in PG County. Uh, Renault is a French uh, man who is uh, a lawyer, also looking forward to doing the same, uh, you know, looking forward to this incubator farm. So I uh, really uh, urge you all to support this program. Okay. It will train people and uh, help to boost the food production in the thank, country. Thank you, Very Mr. Asante. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Asante. Your time is up. Um, we, appre we appreciate your comments. If you would like to supplement them, feel free to submit written comments by October 27th. Um, and we, we invite you to move from Annapolis here. You won't regret it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. David Oney. Is it Oney?
from um, Bowie. Okay. Um, is it no, David Oni. Okay. Brian Barnett Woods. Okay, Mr. Barnett Woods. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Barnett Woods. I live at 3002 Tremont Avenue in Chevrolet, Maryland, uh, with my wife and our three year old son. Um, I do work for the Planning Commission. However, my comments are not representative of my employer. I'm speaking as a resident of the county and someone who enjoys the amenities that Prince George's has to offer. Uh, while Prince George's County has a good trail network, which is both well built and maintained by the Department of Parks and Recreation, there are many instances where trail connections are not fully complete and it's often difficult to reach playgrounds, county nature parks, and recreation centers. Uh, for instance, the Curry Sports and Learning Center and Watkins Regional Park. Um, we would like to see more investment in being able to expand parks trails to better access these great facilities. Additionally, we'd like to see a new park trail design standard document that better addresses practices for designing these trails um, and the needs of people walking and biking especially when trails and roads intersect. We will continue to use the great facilities that Prince George's has to offer, um, and we hope that one day we'll be able to use everything without having to rely on an automobile. Uh, thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Barnett Woods. We appreciate your comments. Um, go Gulliers. From um, representing Prince George's County Food Equity Council. Gul, are you on? Oh, there you are. Hold on a second. I'm muting you. Okay. Shoot. You have to unmute on your end. We've unmuted you here. Okay, there you are. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, indeed. Okay. Good to hear from you. Good evening. Okay. Good evening, members of the planning board. My name is Gül Gülaris with the Prince George's County Food Equity Council. I'm here tonight to request funding for the proposed urban agriculture incubator. For me personally, this is a dream comes true. During my career at the planning department, I spent many years doing research on agriculture, urban agriculture, and food systems, and prepared several reports on these subjects. I also worked on the resource conservation plan. All these documents mention the importance of urban agriculture as a tool for food security, economic development, land preservation, community building, sustainability, environmental protection, and more. They also all recommend an establishment of an urban agriculture institute. In 2012 Urban Agriculture Report, it is on page 95 under economic development recommendations. In 2015, Health to Food for All Prince George's, it is on page 134. There is also information about a promising practice, Seattle Tilt Farmworks, a farm incubator established on Seattle Parks and Recreation Land. 2017 Resource Conservation Plan under Policy Area Supporting Urban Agriculture recommends establishing an urban agriculture incubator on public land to inspire future farmers to excel in a field that contributes to the sustainable way of life. It also mentions that these efforts will contribute greatly to the overall health and well-being of Prince George's and ensure future economic prosperity in the county. I cannot stress enough the importance of urban agriculture for food security, public health, and economic development. Its importance has become more obvious during this pandemic. You may ask why urban why an incubator? Because there are many beginning farmers who are trained and ready to start, but they don't have money to, to buy, even rent farmland and invest in infrastructure and equipment. They don't have the experience to run a business enterprise. They don't know how to market. In short, they don't have the courage to take the risk of starting a new business without knowing whether it will be successful. An urban agriculture incubator will be answer to all of these unknowns. It will provide affordable land with infrastructure and equipment to share, as well as technical assistance and mentorship. It will help grow successful farmers. Prince George's County has been a pioneer in urban agriculture in the region. 
the incub this incubator will be a first in the region and will prove that Prince George's County is the leader. This urban agriculture incubator will be one of the best investment park and planning ever made. Please support it and provide funding for its success. Thank you very much. Um, you know what? I, it, it's a pleasure to hear you give um, props to Prince George's County for being a pioneer, but you were part and parcel of that. So we want to say um, thank you to you as well. Um, and, and we still use your publication. Um, it's very, very helpful to us as we propel Prince George's County forward. So it's good to see you. Um, Happy to hear it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Henry Wixon, are you on? Now can you hear me? Now we, yes, we can indeed. Madam Chair and Commissioners, it's wonderful to be before you this evening. My name is Henry Wixon. I'm the chair, or the president rather, of the Glendale Citizens Association, and we appreciate the opportunity to testify before you this evening on the fiscal year 22 budget. A couple of topics we'd like to highlight, they have to do with the Glendale Hospital and the Glendale Hospital Historic District. We have asked for decades for money to mothball and stabilize those buildings. They're getting worse and worse and worse. We're hopeful that there'll be a rehabilitation and adaptive reuse, but we need monies. We see that in the FY21 budget, there's um, uh, some money for PAYGO, but there's nothing in 22 through 25, so we'd like to see monies uh, budgeted there. but in 22 in particular, that's what we're here for tonight. With respect to the historic district, a large portion of that is, is um, designated for parks and recreation. And we ask again for monies uh, in order to generate at least a master plan for the development of that uh, as a regional park. That's 150 acres there, and it could do us all a lot of good in that area of the county. It could also include a multi-generational community center on that site, which we think would be more appropriate than placing that at the Glendale Community Park, which is a relatively small site. The USDA Plant Introduction Station, we again request that money be budgeted for a master plan for the county's use of that if it is acquired from USDA, which has been in the works forever. Marietta Museum included slave quarters, and we ask again for funds for the reconstruction of the slave quarters, including necessarily ar necessary archaeological work. Dorsey Chapel in Glendale, this restored Gothic revival structure, was an active place of worship for the rural African-American community in Glendale for over 70 years. It was 120 years old in 2020, but historic programming at Dorsey Chapel was ended some years ago. As a result of that, Dorsey Chapel was excluded by the Mer Maryland Historic Trust from the 2017 Anacostia Trails Heritage Area designation of the WBNA Trail the Glendale Hospital Historic District, and the Plant Introduction Station in Marietta in Glendale. So we request FY22 funding for historic programming at Dorsey Chapel. The WBNA Trail pedestrian bridges need some maintenance, um, and so we would like to see that, uh, particularly the decking boards uh, on the Hillmead Road and High Bridge Road bridges uh, in order to maintain safety for travelers there. Finally, uh, this is also related to the hospital. There is a water tower at the corner of the, of the wash of the um, Glendale Hospital site. And the District of Columbia has asserted that it belongs to park and planning. It belongs to the county that it was conveyed. And if that is true, then we would like to see some money spent in 22 to clean that structure out up and make it presentable. It is an eyesore. It looks terrible. Finally, I want to say again how much we appreciated Aaron Markovich's activities. He's a force of nature. We're going to miss him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wixon. Right on time. Um, we appreciate your comments, um, as always. And hello to Ms. Medford. Okay. Um, you understand. Cecilia Aguilar. Thank you, Chair Elizabeth and members of the Prince George County Planning Board. I will submit writing and comments in English and in Spanish later. Okay. Uh, mi nombre es Cecilia Aguilar, nacida en Centroamérica y de habla hispana. Mi labor ha sido servir como enlace comunitario a los residentes del área del Northern Gateway. El Northern Gateway CDC me ha brindado la oportunidad de trabajar en diferentes proyectos tales como el Northern Gateway Club de Fútbol y el Censo 2020. 
Gracias a estos proyectos he podido conocer a mi comunidad de diferentes maneras y sus necesidades. Lamentablemente, nuestras comunidades y negocios han sido devastados por la pandemia. Familias enteras han sufrido un gran impacto en la salud y económicamente. Los residentes del norte en Gateway día a día luchan por salir adelante, sin embargo, la falta de oportunidades y recursos hacen que algunas de nuestras comunidades aún continúen vulnerables. Es por ello por lo que me involucré en el trabajo del Norte en Gateway CDC, ya que creemos fuertemente en que trayendo los recursos necesarios a nuestras comunidades, estas podrán reconstruirse en el futuro para que todos tengan una mejor calidad de vida. En el proyecto del Censo 2020, el Norte en Gateway CDC participó en alrededor de 60 reuniones, incluyendo eventos en conjunto con nuestros socios destacados. Prince George County Park and Recreation, Memorial Library System, la Clínica del Pueblo, Mary Center, Prince George County District 2, Council Member Danny Taveras, PGC Police Athletics Liga, Langley Park Civic Association, Small Teams Betters y con la Comunidad de la Fe bajo el liderazgo del Padre Yasek. En diferentes eventos logramos distribuir alrededor de 25 mil flyers con información importante acerca del censo. Muchas de las distribuciones del censo eran conjunto con distribuciones de comida en esta área. Organizaciones han dado cientos de libras de comida con nuestros esfuerzos del censo 2020. Y en el último evento que el Norte Gateway CDC coordinó, contamos con la presencia y soporte del senador Malcolm Agustin y PGCPS Board Member Pamela Busser y Consul Member Danny Taveras. Este evento se realizó con el fin de unir y generar la participación de cada residente en la comunidad. Así también brindamos asistencia con atención a necesidades básicas de primera importancia. En este mismo evento, alrededor de 500 bolsas de libros y comidas fueron entregadas a más de 250 familias necesitadas. También instalamos en diferentes localidades yard signs, hablamos personalmente con nuestros negocios locales del área e instalamos posters en ellos. Así también hicimos banca telefónica, mensajes de texto con residentes. Ms. Aguilar, el propósito. Aguilar. ¿Sí? your time is up. Okay. Okay, thank you. But can you submit? We, we look forward to hearing you. I don't speak Spanish, but I took it in school. I got some of what you said, but if you could submit it in writing, it would be very, very help, helpful to us, as you said, yes, in English I'll and Spanish. Yes, I will submit in, in English and later. That, that's mm -hmm. fine. That would Thank be great. You. Thank you. Now, um, we Thank have you. we have one other person who might, who, um, Zoila, Zola, uh, um, oh. Cecilia, is, is that? I think it's... Is that someone else? Uh, soy yo, sí, soy yo, pero yo creo que se subió dos veces. You said that, yeah, that's that's her Betty, but she thinks she signed up twice. Okay, that's what it, okay, thank you, because it has slightly two different names. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Gracias. so we look forward to Gracias. it. And look, and look, thank you, Commissioner Duana. Okay, uh, um, we thank you so much. Um, for, for your testimony today. And so we're going to, that concludes the sign up list for today. So um, we thank you all for logging on remotely and for navigating this pandemic in these very strange times with us together. Um, so as a reminder, uh, we have until the close of business Tuesday, October 27, 2020 to send in your written comments as shown. You can fax it, you can um, email it, um, or you can mail it. Um, I have to take a moment to just say I, we, we really and truly appreciate your flexibility, your cooperation, and your support as we continue to move our planning functions, our parks and recreation functions, and all of the commission functions moving forward in a safe fashion during our new normal. We, very tough times, very tough times for everyone. We have food insecurity, we have people who are sick, we have people who are dying, the numbers are over 200, um, to over 214,000 um, deaths in the country. So very tough times physically, emotionally, financially, in every conceivable way. So we ask that you make every effort to stay safe, 
to look out for one another, to stay strong, to stay resilient, and to remain ever hopeful that as we strive to get through these very, very challenging times together. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.